Well, good morning. This is Leo with Carol. We're all Engineer. speechless. <laughs> I, w- I was hoping one of us was going to cut that off. Well, but, uh, um, yeah. Let this that... good morning. It's Tampa Home Talk, and we are live. In fact, in the studio today on Good Friday, we are the only live broadcast on this whole radio station. I think we are. That is absolutely correct. And I know a lot of the other stations are shut down as well. And I just have to give a huge, huge. Shout out to Pat George. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pat. For coming you in today. Me, you can pay me in yellow peeps. I thought you were going to say yellow tequila. <laughs> Do the peeps come in pink too? <laughs> yeah, they come pink, blue, yellow. Yeah, I like the yellow ones. It's because they taste different than the pink ones, right? <laughs> Well, thank you, Pat, for coming in. Clearly, like I was listening on the way in, you were very needed because the traffic, like I can't believe there's really an issue today with traffic, with it being Good Friday. But you've Yeah, well, school is out. Today. School is out, but it's still busy, and especially in the 6 o'clock and uh, closer to 7 o'clock hour, it was very busy on the Howard Franklin and 275, but like in that last report, it is moving along nicely right now. Oh, good. Good, good, good. All right. So welcome. This is Tampa Home Talk. If it's your first time ever listening, welcome. The mission of our show is to help you keep and maintain great credit, live within your means and build wealth. Um, Every week we have some amazing guests that talk about all sorts of stuff in and around the real estate and homeowner space. And Leo, myself and Adam try to make the show fun and give you some good information and be a little bit silly. Absolutely. I love the silly part. I want to run with the silly part. I In know, fact, would, let's talk about myths today. You would just be silly the whole hour, wouldn't you? Yeah. Said, I would I'd definitely be like, well, you're going to be gone later this month. I'm going to go silly. Yeah, I've got a couple uh, episodes I'm going to be missing in late April or May. Wait, and May. June. Why don't we pull a prank on Adam from Adam uh, from Tally Insurance? And why don't we both be out for a given day? Oh, we are going to both what do, be what out do, for What do you think day? about the 31st for that day? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's right after Memorial Day. Why don't you and I go on a vacation? Because why would we take and our vacation? And then he thinks we're coming, we're not. Why would, I, why would I take a vacation during the holiday? I'd rather just take it when I have to use PTO. So let's, let's take a vacation. Let's leave him alone for a week and see what happens. What do you think would happen? He would probably burn down the studio. I'm gonna well, you're asleep. insuring it, so you would that, have to explain that I think that Pat one. and I would have a good time. I think it would work out well. He's like, I'm going to Beasley. I'm not responsible for anything. Absolutely. <laughs> But there's buttons to push. So um, our topic for today's show is five yes. myths and facts about real estate agents. And so I thought this is pretty cool because I'm going to tell you the stuff that most agents are not going to tell you. And, you know, a lot of this stuff, including me, I've been in this space for 28 years. I started on the mortgage side. So as well versed as I was in the whole thing, even myself didn't really find the value in a lot of agents, including when I bought my last house 15 years ago. So w- clearly... We're not all the same, and um, it's just interesting, that whole process that we went through. Have I ever shared that? I don't think I've shared that on the air at least, right? Hmm. So when I bought my last house, which was like 15, almost 16 years ago, I actually wasn't licensed. So I'd been through the real estate course several times for knowledge, never actually took the state exam Mm -hmm. to get my license. I had worked with a lot of agents on the mortgage side. Right. And so I never wanted to think I was competing with them. I kind of just took it for knowledge. Like I took the title license and all that sort of stuff. So basically what happened was, um, the experience with the agent that I had, which this was somebody that we used mutually, right. With clients, Mm -hmm. it was so bad that I, it was just bad. And so I said, I'm going to kind of do this on my own. And, um, that's what happened. I actually ended up negotiating my own deal. Um, I bought the house without a home inspection. Why would you do that? I would never do that again, just Why for the record. I'm just that? telling you, I would was, never do it again. It was 2004. It was the Wild West. Well, it wasn't quite wild yet, but it was on its way to being wild. Prices were doubling every six months. Well, and as a matter of fact, the house that we own now, the one that we bought, there was a contract on it. And they had a contingency to sell their home. And we didn't have any contingencies because we mm. didn't. We still had another home, but we didn't need to make that a contingency. And I was already pre-approved because I came from the last one. And you know, this is before the housing market crash and collapse. So mm-hmm. literally, I had already been through underwriting. All I needed was new insurance and an appraisal, and it was done quick. Like literally, I think it was clear to close, underwritten, everything done less than a week, which you couldn't do now. You know, with Tritt. it would never happen. Now, how 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 old was the house when you bought it? Um, I should know exactly what year my house was built, but I think it was 93 or 94. 
Okay, so it was, it was only ten years old, That's right? Like good, Roughly good 10, twelve wow. years old. Yeah. So, but there was quite a few things, you know, that we found later. Mm-hmm. Like for example, it doesn't matter now because all of it's gone. But the kitchen tile was literally the grout was painted over, and we didn't uh, even realize that. Mm. Like, it's just so many little things that popped up later. In the drywall. And now is that up. now is that even something that you would find in an inspection? I mean, maybe painted you, grout? but. I'm not necessarily sure painted grout would be a defect. And now if it's were, not a defect, but it was just weird. Yeah, it was it'd be weird, so it's not really a defect. But would you even notice it on it? Like if you were walking through that kitchen, I do would, you think that would have even been I, caught? Or? I would notice it immediately, but I don't know if I would. It's not a defect, so you wouldn't even. You yeah. might say, "Hey, I'm not putting this in here." It's but like I think some of these tiles are ugly, but I'm not going to say <laughs> I'm not going to put that in a home inspection report. <laughs> so what happened ugly was ugly tiles so, have them replaced. You know, <laughs> ugly tiles. So there was a contract on this, and they had a contingency to sell. So the mm-hmm. listing agent went back to the buyer that was under contract and said, "Hey, you have to remove." your contingency to sell because we have a kickout clause and if you don't we got another offer we're going to take it so they Mm -hmm. said no we're not we don't we can't do that we don't want to do it whatever and i said well i'm ready to go so she gave him like 24 hours notice on the kickout clause or by a certain amount of time so she basically kicked them out rolled to our contract and then they ended up getting a contract on their home like a day later but it was too late and then we closed quick so it just worked out great but so this is the point like i learned so much in that experience and i really negotiated my own deal because the agent that opened the door actually borrowed someone else's e key, which is a big no no, no as you guys know. I signed a lot of paperwork yeah. saying I will not lend yeah, my e key to anyone. Actually, now like on your phones, so it's pretty hard to do that because most mm-hmm. people don't really relinquish their phone. But back then, it was a it was a manual little active key. Speaking yeah. of phones, and it actually it. it updated with the phone line. It had to literally be plugged in. This is how old this was. Wow. It had to be plugged in, and it, you plugged it into the regular telephone line, and it had to be plugged in at midnight, or your key did not update for the next day. Wow. That makes sense. It was horrible. Speaking of phones, I'm just going to sidebar a little bit, because you know me in a sidebar. Um, I was watching The Flash on CW earlier this week, and they were set in the future, which their future episodes don't really look future, but they had a, a phone, and it was actually built into your wrist. So you would just slide it onto your wrist. I like that. And um, basically, it was still the Google Glass type thing. So your your screen is in front of you, but you can actually just type on your wrist like the quarterbacks do when they're like reading their plays. Wow, okay. that's pretty I'll cool. Buy, I'll buy that. So it was yeah. all like built into the wrist, and I thought that was pretty awesome. I think I saw that somewhere, like on one of those tech hub mm. things. And then is I, that out yet or no? It's well, just... then I, I told my friend about it, and then he showed me like an arm sleeve you can put for your iPhone. But you really can't do the whole like easy to like see in front of you type but i would love to just be able to type on my wrist and see in front of me the the screen see i don't want to type i just want to talk and <laughs> well that too i mean it was just a lot of, it. it was a lot of talk and stuff but i mean yeah i mean with the, the phone built in because i'm constantly looking at it anyway so if there's one less motion of going into my pocket that mm-hmm. would be great i'm surprised you don't do the smartwatch oh i have one well, yeah. they, and they have the, not the foldable phone coming out real I soon, saw too. That. So, I mean, that's so the Razor's the, making a coming. comeback. It's yes. coming. No, no. It's, it's, yeah, the Razor's making a comeback. The Razor's making a comeback. Seriously, did you see it? It is. It's like a, it's a, it's a Android, and it like it unfolds into basically a tablet size, but I then saw it folds it, yeah. back <laughs> into a phone, and the, the outside screen. You know, when it folds out, it's in the middle. But when you fold it back, it's on the outside. So does it also fold into a Volkswagen and talk to me? I don't, I don't know about no, that. No, but part. it does open up into a tablet. Yeah, so that's it's, pretty cool. it's pretty cool. I'll have to take a look at that. All right, so let's dive into some of these five myths and facts about real estate agents. So How number do we know one, if it's a fact or a myth. Well, we're gonna go through <laughs> that, Leo. Of course. Well, I, I thought we were gonna do five myths and five facts, not five. Maybe it's a myth. Maybe it's a fact. I think she's going to lay, lay we'll it out. We'll debunk the myth. We have five. Okay. Wow. She's going to lay out the myth and then give you the no, there's truth. There's only five on this sheet of paper. There's only five. Yeah. 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 So the first thing is um, there's a lot of talk about commission, right? In mm. this space mm-hmm. right now there, with um, you know, Red Bricks and Zillow becoming a brokerage and all this fun stuff, um, you know, that's the first thing people want to cut or save money. And I'm going to tell you why uh, it matters you know, whether you hire just one of these flat fee brokers or somebody like me, that's still very much a full service broker because there's a lot of details that goes into that. Um, And a a common thing too, that a lot of people think is if they go directly to the listing agent, they can just avoid half the commission, right? Or get that discount right off the, right off the top. Maybe we should start with what the purpose of a real estate agent protecting your interest is. And if you learn that, you would never go to the listing agent and say, take me. So we're going to dive into all of that and more when we come back. 
And if you got a question for me, Leo, Adam, our off air number is 813-377-2775. 813-377-2775. I promise once we roll through these, you probably won't do it. We'll be back right after this break. Morning, Tampa Home Talk. Was that a bump music? Oh my gosh, that was such a bump We're, music. So Pat's the only one in the whole building right now, and he's just finding all the crazy stuff. He is doing stuff. whatever he wants to do, clearly. Wow. Well, nobody else is using it, so <laughs> we that can. That's true. Plus, we want to make sure that everyone knows that this is not a pre-record. This is live. We are live. We are looking out for you. Should we get out the studio call and see if anybody's out there actually cruising around for work today? And see if they've that would be a good idea. They want to chime yeah, yeah, yeah. In. Let's, if right. you'd like to talk to us live on the air and you have questions about the myths and facts of real estate agents. And even if you don't want to talk to us on the air, you can talk to Pat and he'll tell us what you yeah. want to say. So you got 888-404-1010. Good job, Leo. That's 888-404-1010. 10, 10. I was going to wonder if you remembered the, the number. That's an easier number yeah. than this one that has it a bunch is, of sevens yes. with a three and a bunch yeah. of sevens with Don't a two. Don't confuse our listeners. 808-404-1010. 888. Not 808. 808. 808 is a base. It's California. Thing. Yeah, no, no. 808's a is a base device used in heavy metal music and um, dubstep to give a really deep, powerful sound. I wouldn't pick him as a metal rocker, would you? But he totally is. I would. You would? I could see look him. At, let's look at the soul patch. He's missing the long the, hair. I had the long hair. You, you try going into a 150 degree attic and have long hair. Yeah. My husband had long hair when I met him. Did I ever tell you that? Yeah. I did? Yeah, we had the story. Okay. I'll have to show you the pictures. Did you see this? I have not. But you, when you show me the pictures, you should show both cameras, the Facebook Live listeners. We will. And the uh, the YouTubers. Myths and facts. You can have long hair. You know. <laughs> You and can. still have a brain. It yeah. works. Yeah. <laughs> you can be an engineer. So the brain right. kind of seeps out through the, through the hair follicles. There. So I today see. we're talking about five myths and facts about real estate agents. And Leo was spot on before we actually dive into the commission thing. Do you need one? That's a great question, right? Do you need a real estate agent? And I, I guess technically the answer is no, you don't need one. But is it a good idea to have one? It's probably a better question. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I guess some of my take on a real estate agent is a lot of buyers out there are pretty savvy. They're going to find their own listings. I know a lot of buyers who basically, yep. they, 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 they troll Drill, Zillow, they troll Trulia, they find their listing, then they're like, I need an agent to put an offer in. They've done 98% mm -hmm. of all the work for the agent. And, and that that's kind of where I... I well, they think they have. That's eh, not really where the value is, eh, right? I don't. That's just not the value. Eh. So let me give you a clear example, right? Bel Air Loop that went under contract last yeah, week. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. So had somebody been working with an agent like me, they would have had access to those pre-listings mm -hmm. before they hit the market. And then they could have had the opportunity to put in an offer, but instead, you know, it, we waited for it to go live and we had 11 offers. So that's a good way to hedge against that. If you've been, if you find that you've been competing against multiple offers and that kind of stuff, if you work with a well-connected agent like me, we have private Facebook groups you can't even see, you guys don't even see them. And we share off-market listings that are coming and all sorts of stuff before they hit the market and they go live. Well, that wasn't that impressive, Adam. I don't use Facebook at all. He liked the <laughs> Facebook listings before you even see them. And Adam's like looking at me like amazed. I'm like, I don't so use So what Facebook. happens when they're pocket listings, right? So I've got, <laughs> I've, I've got well, the one listing, 8801 Rustic Trail. You won't find that anywhere on Zillow, Realtor.com. So what does a pocket listing mean for our so listeners pocket out there? Listing, great question, Adam. Pocket listing means it's not open. It's not live. It's not syndicated to all those third-party sites. So it's kind of held like internally by the listing agent. I don't think it's the best practice personally, but we do see that sometimes on higher profile sellers, right? Like if we were to sell a home for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they might want us to hold it as a pocket listing for at least a time period before it went on the open market. Mm -hmm. And I heard all the Tampa Bay Lightning are selling their local Tampa. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> they might be. It's not, uh, it's not going ever so well. <laughs> so here's the thing too that I want to talk about with regards to the misconception about agents. Like a lot of people think, oh, if they, um, you know, they go directly to the agent or whatever, they can just cut out the commission. Well, the fact is, is the seller's already hired that agent mm -hmm. for the commission no matter what. We agree as agents to share cooperatively with the other agent. So if you come to us direct, we're under zero obligation to cut our commission. And as a matter of fact, our work is double. 
because now we have to do the whole buyer side of the transaction. Um, and the other thing too, people think, oh, there's just one agent, but there's not. Almost always in every case, there's going to be two agents. And you have to think, you know, the agent's not getting the whole 6%. There's a broker split. A lot of times there's a team split. And that doesn't even talk about expenses, right? So when a seller goes in and they say, hey, will you cut your commission? It's, you know, and we went through this wonderful marketing platform on everything we do to market and sell the home. You know, at that point, it's like, okay, which part do you want me to cut out? Because, you know, if you think you're going to go to a company like, you know, Zillow or Purple Bricks, and they're going to do the same thing somebody like me is going to do, it's not going to happen. It's just not. They're counting on a buyer that's fine online to do it, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So, um, th and that's the thing about that. So, again, is it negotiable? Sure, it could be. But what I find is a super strong agent like me, like if we can't even stand up for our own commission, how could we possibly on earth ever negotiate for your money and your best interest oh. if we can't even stand up for ourselves? Slam. Isn't, right. isn't that the truth, Slam. though? It is. Yeah. Like, like yeah. think about it. If I'm representing you and I can't stand up to a small little 6% commission to make sure the buyer's agent on the other side gets paid and don't mm -hmm. skip our listing to make sure that I get a, I do a great job marketing. I don't have to cut anything out. We can full on market the whole thing. You know, if I easily fold and go, all right, I'll take less. What do you think is going to happen when we get an offer? They'll take less. They're going to encourage you to take any offer that comes, mm -hmm. you know? And there's been times that I've literally had sellers ask me, um, do you think we should reduce the price? No, we're getting too much activity right now. Or they get a lower offer and they go, do you think we should take it? It's a really good offer. No, we just hit the market. Our activity is amazing. I'm, I'm calling, you know what, on this buyer, they're going to pay a higher price. And I'm always right, almost all the time. 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm always right. And so prime example, Bel Air Loop, right? They followed our plan that we put into place, we got an offer more than $10,000 above what we listed it for. And we were already on the high side of the comps. And you know, that doesn't even count the fact that, okay, when we, when we get that contract, somebody has to show up that knows a lot of the appraisers, which I do. Mm -hmm. I speak appraiser language. Mm -hmm. I know the use PAP guidelines they have to follow. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be able to fully defend that appraisal report and that contract where a typical agent, they don't know how to read that. They wouldn't even know if the adjustments are the wrong way on the appraisal report. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Preach it, girl. <laughs> Preach it. Just saying. Well, in my, you know, I, it just doesn't make sense to want to go to have one agent be the buyer and seller side. There's uh, that's a different myth. Yeah, you yeah, know. So I mean, yeah, and that. So and we'll talk about that, and we can just jump into that now. So yeah. is it is it okay for the buyer to use the home selling agent? Oh, they could. No. They could. No. But no, no, no. I just. It, uh, you're hiring someone to represent your interests. You can't represent both parties. So here's the thing. Going back to what you said before, Leah, where the buyers feel like they've done all the work, right? They've done all the mm -hmm. research. They found the stuff online. Everything's so on demand, right? From right. food to ride share to everything is just on demand. Um, that It makes sense, right? That, that buyers also think it should be on demand. But let me just put a couple things into perspective for you, right? Those are what we call Pop-Tart agents. I told you guys I was going to share some stuff that most people wouldn't do. But literally... Literally, like if you call an agent and you go, hey, can you uh, show me at this house? Can you go show me this property, this listing you have? I want to see it now. What do you think my next question is going to be to that buyer? Who's your real estate agent? Well, we ask them, sure, do they have an agent? Um, and they'll say, no, I don't have an agent. I'm just going to show up. What, what else do you think we ask? Or do you think uh, we just go to the you property? Been, have you been pre-qualified? Have you been pre-approved or are you paying cash? We do right. ask that question. Yeah, nice question. Why would we ask that? To make sure it's worth your time to drive out there. That's and... one reason. Is there any other reason? See how serious they are at buying a house? Anything else? I don't know. No. Let's see, we can we with the how serious they were. Um, make sure they, they can't afford it. Make sure they can afford a house. Um, interest level. Well, make sure they're a real buyer, oh, right? Definitely. What if they're not qualified to buy the home? We kind of said that. Yeah, yeah we yeah. said that. What, said what that. if they like the photo so much that we're there that they're there to scope it out to come back and rob the house later? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I had that happen before where a guy called me and he said, I want to show the, I want to see this property and I wouldn't take him to see it because he wouldn't just get qualified real quick or show proof mm -hmm. of funds. And he said, "Never mind, I'll just go talk to another agent and have him take him so that he did. And he actually wrote an offer and we got another offer at the same time too. And I could see on the phone, the caller ID who the guy was and I matched it up with the offer. And then I told my seller, go, by the way, this agent made an appointment to show this buyer. Uh, when you left your home for an hour, the buyer wasn't even pre-approved. So we don't really know how qualified they are even to buy the house. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, it just was a, a layer of weirdness. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say that I would take the offer either. So the seller didn't. They took another offer. Nice. 
So, you know, it just goes to the fact that, I mean, it's not fair to the seller to kick them out of their house for an hour, right? right? So someone can show the property that might not be qualified. A lot of times these showings are happening during dinner time and all sorts of stuff. You know, we'll show you anything you want to see if you're qualified, but our approach is just so different. We're not a pop chart agent. We're going to run out and show your property. We're going to sit down. We're going to do a thorough consultation just to make sure we know why you want to move. Are you ready for home ownership? Do you, you know, people say they want to sell. We're going to roll through. Well, why do you want to sell? Let's chat about that. You know, because people don't wake up and go, I think I'm going to sell my house today. I wake up every morning and say that. <laughs> yeah, they, well, you know, they don't though. Like if you no, truly. No, I, I literally do. I'm like, I, I really want to sell my house today. So if you want to sell your house, there's a reason. Yeah. And that's my job is to discover that reason and put together a plan that makes sense. It all makes sense. I don't own my house. All right. So our author number is 813-377-2775. Again, our author number is 813-377-2775. You can call or text if you need some real estate help. 813-377-2775. When we come back, um, we're going to run into this a little bit more and talk about the fiduciary responsibility that the listing agent actually has to the seller. So what happens when you go direct? We'll chat about that when we come back right after this break, right here on Tampa Home Talk. So stick around on Money Talk 1010, Tampa Bay's business address. We'll be back in just a jiffy. Welcome back to Tampa Home Talk. This is Adam Talley with Talley Insur Insurance. Joining <laughs> insurance, uh, joining Katrina you Madewell wow. and Leo Kane. And today we're talking about five myths and facts about insurance uh, and uh, the real estate agents. So Katrina, take us away with our next uh, Wait, myth. Wait, we have here. insurance myths and facts? <laughs> uh, no. That's we're next just, hour, we're maybe. We're just messing with them like insurance. <laughs> So I can't speak today. It's all right. Trip over my own words, too. Don't feel bad. <laughs> so if you missed the earlier part of the show, we were talking a little bit about, uh, you know, the 6% commission real estate myth. You want to, you might want to listen to this whole show in its entirety. Which you can do that on yes, YouTube. YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it goes to a podcast. And there's a lot of ways to catch our shows once they air. Uh, but we were talking about, is it okay to use the other agent, right? When you're selling your home. And, uh, I mean, you could. But, again, that when a listing agent is hired... You know, they represent the seller, period, no matter mm -hmm. what. Even they're, they're a transaction broker, they represent the seller's best interest. Their job is to get the seller the highest possible price, you know, in the least amount of time with the least amount of headaches. And uh, at the end of the day, they're going to do what's best for the seller. So if you go directly... You could, you know, I like to think we're pretty fair in that. But like, if you say, Hey, will the seller take this amount? I can't tell you that. I'm not going to tell you, even if I know it's not fair to the seller. And so, you know, aside from that, like when you think about some of the best buyer's agents, not only are they super well connected in the community, but they're going to know a lot of the ins and the outs about homes. You know, they know whether or not homes have been listed and relisted. They typically have seen them at one point or another. And then aside from that, they're connected to amazing people in the community and people that are going to do just a rock star job like you, Leo, um, for our home inspections. I mean, we've talked about this before, but we've had inspectors on our list, you know, that we were partners with that we actually terminated our relationship with them because you know our relationship with our clients is is for good like we want to talk to them years after they buy their home we want to be a part of their move up process you know all the way to where they're an empty nester and be that go-to resource for questions that they have so the last thing we want is an inspector that is going to cover stuff up you know uh, there's a way to present it that freaks the buyers out mm -hmm. and some inspectors do a terrible job at that i think you guys are really good at presenting you know just fact actual information. Look, this is not an expensive part. It sounds horrible, but it's an easy fix, And but it's kind of a big deal. You should take care of it right away. I think if the report it doesn't make the house sound like it's falling apart, it's not a very good report. Right. Because every house well, is falling apart to some extent. They're all going to have issues, right? Yes. That's what we tell people. Every single home, I don't care if you buy a new home, you're going to find defects, no, right? Especially on a new home. Exactly. So they're all going to have defects. It's just, you know, what are those defects? Can you live with them? And if they're new, you're not going to live with them at all. Oh, I've got a If you have somebody like me. Tell. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll save it. We'll save, save it for the end. I've got fun. a horror story about inspection I did yesterday on a new build. <gasps> oh, oh no. good. Save it. Save it. Save it. We'll do the last segment. Okay? 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 okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And so another thing, too, is once you start with an agent, are you stuck with them? Right? We get that. 
right. sometimes quite a bit. And so the truth is, if you hire a listing agent, you might be, right? Because a lot of times there's uh, termination clauses in that, rightfully so. Uh, and the reason why is a lot of times agents, really good listing agents like me, we're going to have a lot of front-loaded expenses and costs. And if you think about that, we're one of the very few professions in the world that work 100% on contingency, which means if I'm taking your listing, I have to put all of my upfront time, money, marketing efforts, everything it's going to take to get your home sold for a price that's acceptable to you. And if I don't do that, I earn zero. I earn nothing. Now on those as a, as a listing agent on those, is there a, like a time period that, mm-hmm. you know, if you, if you haven't sold it in six months, then can we, mm-hmm. you, that would you know? be the amount of your contract. Right. And so that the a time period of the contract mm-hmm. might be different, right. Depending on what market that you're in. Um, most contracts are going to be at least six or 12 months. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we start taking a little bit longer to sell properties, you're definitely going to see one year contracts and that's going to be normal. You know, I think the key is communication. Right. Are you communicating with your seller regularly on what you're doing to market and advertise and sell their home? You know, are you are you sharing with them what you're doing? Like, what are your marketing efforts? How are they in the loop on exactly what's happening to sell their home? Now, do you get more time if it's, say, a $10 million house? Obviously, there's not $10 million buyers. So would that contract maybe be two two years long, possibly? Um, I mean, what's an average time for something like you that? You cannot take a listing over one year. It's not binding. Okay. Right. So, and it's, it's just like even leases, right? They're mm-hmm. not binding in the state of Florida unless they're prepared by an attorney and witnessed by two people. Any leases over a year. So basically, you know, it, it's only a one-year contract. So what okay. happens is you would either do a new one or do an extension. Really, it would be a new contract, not an extension. Yeah, I think the longest listing I've seen recently was um, two weeks ago. We inspected a house. It was commercial property, and they take longer to sell. But right. she had been s- selling it for six years. Oh, wow. It was a six-year listing. Why? Well, over the course of the six years, uh, they would get tenants in. They'd pull it off the market, go back oh. on the market. They needed some repair work. It wasn't done. Then they pulled it off to renovate. So, I mean, it was off so and on. So, they were like half in the water, half really, out of the water. And you really, can't really do that, you know? It's just a hard way to sell a home with a tenant in there. Like, and I get it, that the mm-hmm. cash flow well, business, position. But, yeah, but six, a six-year listing and then uh, finally sold it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you know, commercial is a little different. Yeah. They do take longer to sell. Um, so the long and the short of it is if you got a listing agent, you probably are stuck with them. However, you know, most people are super reasonable. Like if I ever, if I have a customer that ever feels like you're not doing your job or I'm disappointed or, or if we feel like we've let them down, you know, we'll give them the option to terminate and we're not going to charge them anything. Uh, we like to call that our easy exit guarantee. And we just want people to be happy. We want them to know we're doing everything we can to sell their home and we'll communicate whatever it is. Right. Right. If we think what they should stay on the market a little longer at the price they're at, we'll tell them that. If we feel like they're overpriced, we're going to tell them that too. So it's just a matter of telling them the truth, even when they don't want to hear it, right? I'm going to be that agent that just says, this is how I feel. Mm-hmm. You know, at the end of the day, it's your home, but here's my professional opinion. Here's the details I'm going to give you. Um, and then on the buyer side, you know, so many agents do not work with a buyer agency agreement. And I don't understand that. Hmm. You know, again, they're going to invest everything, all their upfront time, money, you know, everything it's going to take to basically be a a tour guide, you know, (laughs) that's what the traditional agent does. But uh, we're really more, we take, we just take the consultative approach. We're going to sit down, talk them through the process, make sure they know what goes into it, make sure they know how much money they're going to need to buy the home, just make sure they're prepared. Right. And there's been times that we've even had investors looking to buy their first investment property and we've talked about it. And then I'll something just doesn't feel right. And I'm like, wait a minute, let's just reset. I know we already met for a consultation, but let's talk again. And then sometimes when we dive into their budget and other things, we're like, you're a little while out before you should be buying an investment property, just not prepared. And so we would rather wait and sell them a home in two years than to try to sell something now. Uh, because we know it's a difference between them succeeding or not, right? And if we sell you an investment property, you're successful, it's profitable, you're prepared, you're not feeling like you're you're crunched, right? If you don't have a tenant one month or something, um, you're way more likely to buy several more investment properties through us, right? Than you would be if we just sold you something and disappeared, which is what the average agent does. Right. Would you agree? Yeah. 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 A lot of them too. All right. So then basically the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, one agent is just as good as the next. Oh, uh, right. (laughs) Well, I think you just laid out a lot of reasons this why whole, that's this, not the case. This whole show exists to debunk that one. Let's just skip it. <laughs> so, well, you, could, you could have found a better better myth and truth than that one. But think about it. When people hear the term realtor, right, which actually not all agents are realtors, 
it depends on whether they subscribe to the National Realtor Code of Ethics to be a realtor. That's the difference. Did you, you know say that? Subscribe in quotes. Because it's a membership, technically. Yeah. Yeah. So it's you know, but but. With that membership, you have to agree to follow by the code of ethics. So, and if you don't, there's actually a hearing, like all kinds of stuff that goes into that. So, not all agents are realtors. And when people hear the word agent, you know, they think it's just like somebody that shows up and opens a door and that kind of stuff. How would I know if my real estate agent is a is a realtor or not? You could ask them. You could ask them flat out, "Are you a realtor?" Some of them wear the blue pants. Or your real estate agent. Yeah, some of them do. Um, but they get what they call a NARDS number, which is National Association of Realtors uh, <laughs> number. And the other thing, too, like if, you're, if your agent is not a realtor, they also don't have access to MLS. They can't see the realtor notes. They can't see a lot of stuff, which is crazy that you can actually be an agent, not have access to the MLS, not have an e-key. It's incredible, but it happens. How can you, how can you even make That's, money that way without doing that? How can you that? be an they agent? I don't even understand fax that. machine too <laughs> they might <laughs> they might hey we we have a lot of st we get a lot of stuff from banks and it's all facts and I, I'm yeah. like yeah you want me to crumple up a sheet of paper three or four times <laughs> run it through a scanner on 100 dpi and then email it to you <laughs> fax machine here's the thing too another thing that i think make it makes an agent a really good agent because we see a lot of transplants right and people mm -hmm. that come from other areas and they're like oh i'm just gonna sell real estate in tampa now great you know how well are they really gonna know the neighborhood right. you know i think an agent should live in a, an area for at least 10 years unless they're under a team with somebody like me that can dive in and help but literally you give me a street and i can tell you where it's at i can tell you what neighborhood it's in so that's the difference between somebody like me that's been around for a long time we know the neighborhoods and the areas that are shifting and changing Adam and, and I just came up with a trivia show for you. What's that? And we're going to random streets. <laughs> name that name, street. Name the zip name code. Name that street. Name that okay. It's going to be on. I can feel it. So yeah, there's just a, there's a big difference, you know, between the agent plugging something in GPS and actually knowing their way around and all that sort of stuff. And, and the other thing too, an agent like me, we're, it's the, we're all about that long-term relationship. Repeat referrals, past clients, about 92% of our business is all past clients. Um, and so number five is you can't buy a for sale by owner if you have an agent. Do you think that's true? Like you can't go to a for sale by owner and buy a home, buy their home if you have an agent? Well, I think you can. I think the person that I think the person that is listing it on their own is, you know, going to find out a reason why they should have had a listing agent pretty quickly. Yeah, they're I mean, not I, built send, to negotiate. Send my, send but my agent in, in a heartbeat, renegotiate that. I'd also hire an engineering firm to make the FISBO, which is the for sale by owner house, sound like it's falling apart. Yeah. And then use that to scare the Tear seller apart. who doesn't have an agent to get that price even lower. So let me give you just a couple little tips about this, right? And we talk about that in our buyer consultation. We tell people, if, they, if you see a for sale by owner home, FISBO. We, we can actually take you and sell that home to you. The key is for a buyer's agent, you don't pay us, right? The seller and their agent pay us. So if they don't have an agent, mm -hmm. then we have to go in and negotiate that commission. And almost always, for sale by owner homeowners that are trying to sell their home on their own are willing to pay a buyer's agent half of the commission to come in and write the deal, you know, organize a whole the whole details that go into mm -hmm. successfully closing a home and get them successfully to the finish line. The only two times I would say we really see a for sale by owner person say, no way, no how am I going to work with an agent is two things. Number one, we're going to make them fill out a seller's disclosure statement. Mm -hmm. So I don't care if they've lived in the house for a month or it's an investment property. We want to know whatever they know about the home. Mm -hmm. So if they are reluctant to fill out a seller's disclosure, there's something, there's a defect or something they don't want to disclose, they're probably not going to be willing to work with an agent. The second thing is their home is overpriced. So we will already run comps. We will, mm -hmm. we will run through that detail. So think about that. You've got about two grand that you're gonna be putting into a home when you write an offer. You, you have probably minimum $1,000 escrow deposit, minimum, probably mm -hmm. more than that, 500 bucks for an inspection, right? Depending at on least, how many inspections you least, need. At least, how big, and how big the house is, right? And then by the time you get to the appraisal, which is the value piece, that's another 500 bucks. Mm -hmm. So you're into this for a minimum of $2,000. So why would you want to find out then that the home is overpriced and it's not going to appraise right. when an agent like me is going to look at the comps and tell you that right away, right? All right, so we're going to talk more about these four sub owners when we come back on Tampa Home Talk in just a minute. And 
I've never heard that song before. I'm struggling today, Pat. I will find you're, it. You're, you're I've never heard it. that. I thought it for a second. Oh, wait till we get to your hour. The fun's going to be Oh, good. my goodness. I can't even handle it. Oh, I'll believe it. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, it's here. almost Easter. Yeah. It is almost Easter. We do have the second coming of our hour soon. Yes, the we do. Coming. Yes, we do. All right. So today's show was all about <laughs> myths and facts of real estate agents. We talked about some stuff that... Probably your average agent is not going to tell you. Put some stuff kind of straight and narrow that a lot of other agents might not say. And you can pick the whole show up in its entirety on a podcast. You can watch it on YouTube. A lot of different ways to reconnect and watch it. We stream live on Facebook and we'll share that as well on Tampa Home Talk. So there's a number of different ways to rewatch it. Where we left off, we were talking about, you know, even buying a for sale by owner home. Fisbo. Yeah. Fisbo or for sale by owner Fisbo. home. Sounds like a, a family agent. clown, right? Yeah. Fisbo. So and when we talked about basically a couple of reasons why a for sale by owner Owner would not want to work with an agent, right? You think those are pretty accurate? Never probably thought about those. Maybe, they're, yeah, hi- yeah. maybe they're hiding a sinkhole. Yeah, home. I was going to say they know about the sinkhole under the house and they just don't want to tell so people. So the house that I actually pulled out from under contract, that's exactly what I think happened. They had a settlement issue of some sort. Seller didn't describe it, didn't disclose it. And we basically said we're out. Mm-hmm. So, but, so here's the thing I want you to know about uh, that. I want sellers and the person listening to know about you know, selling the home on their own compared to putting on the open market and working with a buyer's agent. There's four different kinds of buyers, right? Okay. That's a new show. That's a whole new show. We're going to another list. They're serious and in a hurry buyers, right? Mm. Somebody coming into town, they're going to be here. Like remember John, he was here for two days. We have a mission to find a home, put it under contract, get their inspections and be done. Wow. And he'll come back in a month and so sign the papers and that's they're it. They're serious and in a hurry, right? Second type of buyer is serious, not in a hurry. Oh, I hate those. So it could be somebody looking for months, maybe even years. You know, a lot of times it could be first time home buyers. They're a little bit nervous about the process. But don't and they always classic turn, looky don't they always turn into from serious, not in a hurry, turns into serious in a hurry? Depends on the motivation level, right? Mm-hmm. They could. Sometimes they do. But this, as a seller, like, how do you know? You don't know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're just basically serious, but not in a hurry. So if they find the right one, they'll buy it. But usually they're going to want a pretty good deal on it, right? Of to pull course. the trigger and move forward. What about not serious and in a hurry? Third kind of buyers is going to be your investors, oh, right? So yeah. the ones that we had literally a Boston Matrix going here, we had we Sirius did. and you had Speed, and then they were going to we're going to talk about the four quadrants. No, I'm just giving you straight and narrow the four different types the of more buyers. More columns. Here. I mean, this is pretty accurate, right? Serious in a hurry, serious not in a hurry, mm-hmm. and then the investors, right? That want to buy stuff off market. They literally sometimes want to kind of steal the house, take some of your equity. They're looking for a deal. That's their business model. It works great for some sellers that need it right away. Most sellers want the most money they can get from their biggest asset so when that happens experience shows putting on the open market makes sense um, and the fourth type of buyers are your looky lose <laughs> your curious neighbors the people that love to run through open not houses serious, not in a hurry that's right okay you're trying to steal my thunder i just didn't get to it yet no 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 i just don't so so then what would be the serious no we get serious not in a hurry not so what would be not in a hurry but serious not in a hurry with your investors okay yeah, so, yeah. right that not in a hurry the, but is, serious is the boston matrix then yeah. Did I, I? Did I? Yeah, you did. You did please the, you in my answer. <laughs> it, it, it conformed to the the MIT um, MBA matrix. I wasn't even following that, but what I was saying made total sense, right? Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna put the business. This is money talk. We got to talk about MIT here. That's right. So let's hear about your your defunct. Yes, I'd love. I want to hear the we defunct promised our on listeners the we were brand talk new about home. This. this was hilarious. So we, I love the stories that we, we share. What we, we see during the week. We get hired to um, oversee some new build constructions, and we get hired to. Which, do, by the way, don't ever skip that. You might mm-hmm. think, oh, you got the builder's warranty. You don't need to hire somebody like Leo. Wrong, 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 wrong. Hire an inspector, especially on new construction. Yeah. And sometimes we get hired by the builders to make sure their contractors are doing what they're supposed to be doing so an unnamed builder in an unnamed area um because i don't i don't talk bad about anybody but anyway they um i was out there i was supposed to do a block inspection so basically a block inspection is the block walls and i was supposed to make sure that the 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 stuff above the windows were installed correctly they're called lintels and it's probably my easiest inspection because the the lintels are all precast which means they're made somewhere else they're installed so it's like i've never failed one of these before but there's a first time for everything. <laughs> this one failed. This one failed. So I get out of the car and I'm walking up to the house and I can see from a distance that the block work looks off. I'm like, I can see, this is from a distance. I can see some of the mortar lines are thick. Some of them are thin. Oh. They're all supposed to be uniform. So I get closer and I start looking and some of them are over an inch and some of them are like 
maybe a quarter of an inch. They're all supposed to be three eighths of an inch. So basically, what happened was yesterday I was told that they were going to do two days worth of block work in one day. So I was already suspect because how how are you going to do two days, two wow. full days worth of block work in one day? So I'm walking across this house and I'm like, well, let me guess. They started over here and they worked their way around counterclockwise. They're like, yes. How do you know that? I'm like, because the worst section is the last section they did. So they rushed through they it. They rushed through it. So on top of that, they didn't actually have their mortar mixed correctly. So, so what does that mean from a structural perspective, like from an engineer? Do they just have to start over? How no, no. There, there's, like, there's t- a, talk about there's that. The mortar fix. mix is not so mixed the, correctly. So the mortar mix is going to be a combination of basically grout, sand, and water. And when it's not done correctly, what does that mean? It becomes chalky, sandy, and crumbles apart. So when you the stuff between your blocks is too thick and crumbling, your blocks are going to compress and your house is going to settle. So I started to see hairline step cracks. Already? One just day, the block phase? In the block, just one day after. And I started walking up to some of the mortar and I started like, was able to use my finger to like, and it was flaking off. And I'm like, oh the mortar gosh. mix was wrong on this. Comes to find out, the, 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 the builder themselves told me that they thought it was odd that they ordered twice the amount of sand and, and grout that they actually needed to use. When in reality, they only used half the amount of sand and grout that they actually needed to use. They just watered it down because it was faster to, pour, faster to spread when it was watered down. It was crumbling away. So he's like, well, what do I do? I'm like, well, to fix this properly, you need to gr- you need to take grout from a cement truck and fill all the concrete cells. So you get a solid pour house. I don't even th- I would walk away and say you're building me another house from no, scratch. No, no, I mean that's the actually the builder is going to end up with a better product because now they're going to have a fully fully poured house. So it'd be okay. like superior construction almost. Basically. So instead of block with the holes, they're going to fill it. Yeah, instead of block with the holes, they're now going to fill it because they have to because that's the only way you're going to get everything to to gel correctly. On top of that, they're going to need to basically seal all the existing cracks that are forming. While we're on this point, um, why it's don't... It's very important to have your inspection. I, I know it's really quick. It's, it's a long conversation for another day. But real quick, when you do an inspection on a new build, it's not like an existing home where you come in and it's already there and you do it. There's t- different stages mm-hmm. that you actually want to get an inspection. What are those critical the points st- stages in the Stages are basically um, right before the slab's poured, right before the drywall's put on, Right, bef- like, right after your mechanical stuff's in, your electrical stuff's in, but nothing's really functional, and then at the end for a punch list. All right. So a little bit out of the norm. We're going to roll this conversation into the next hour because yeah, yeah. I think it's so relevant, and we don't talk about it enough. But we are going to talk about also seven insurance facts that may surprise you with Adam Talley here on Tampa Home Talk. I'm your host, Katrina Madewa. We'll be back for the second hour in just a moment. And our off-air number is 813-377-2775. You can call or text 813-377-2775. Love where you live or we'll fix it. We'll be back in just a few minutes.